my lord. Um, so just uh, before the short adjournment, um, I, I had begun uh, the first of three parts of my submissions looking at the uh, common law position before Section 9 was enacted. Um, uh, and the two cases that we've uh, included in uh, the authorities bundle, um, which I've summarised to paragraphs 52 to 58 of my skeleton argument very briefly, uh, the, the Court of Appeal uh, in, in King and Lewis uh, and the House of Lords' decision um, in, in Berezhovsky. Um, putting it in a nutshell, th this is how foreign convenience worked uh, when, when libel uh, foreign convenience was still governed by the common law. Uh, King and Lewis is an interesting example where um, the, the, the court accepted that there were a, a range of different factors and it really would uh, like to come down to the claimant's um, relationship to this jurisdiction uh, as opposed to at the other end of the spectrum, those who were, as it were, sort of pure libel tourists. Uh, we, we put in just the one uh, uh, point upon which we say that King and Lewis would no longer be good law uh, at, at, at common law, which is the, the idea that juridical advantage shouldn't be considered till the second stage uh, fell away following the uh, Supreme Court's decision in B2B and Nutritech. But King and Lewis, we say, is a, a sort of an, a, a great exemplar of how foreign companions worked in libel cases uh, at common law. And we say, subject to um, the different burdens and standards of proof that are introduced by Section 9 is actually a fairly um, workable approach to the different factors that the court uh, has to have regard to uh, uh, under Section 9 cases uh, because it's a modification rather than a whole new regime. I, I would like, if I may, to turn up Berezhovsky uh, very briefly, which is in the Appeal Authorities Volume 1 uh, at Tab 2. Uh, uh, and the reason to turn it up uh, is that really this is um, perhaps the origins uh, of, of what comes to be the, the, the reform in section uh, 9.2 uh, and 9.3. At page uh, 1011 of the report, that's page 110 in the electronic uh, bundle, Um, uh, between uh, 1011H at the bottom of the page uh, and at uh, the top um, of page 1013C, uh, just for your ladyships and your lordships note. Um, there, there were, uh, at different appellate stages, arguments formulated uh, that, um, notwithstanding that as a matter of English law, um, each publication is a, a separate tool. And so if you publish 10 times in England and Wales and three times in Germany and five times in the United States, they, they will be separate publications. That there had been a like a strong version of the single unified tort theory put forward by uh, the appellants in the House of Lords, saying that for the purposes of foreign convenience, the English court should treat publication on the internet as a single tort. Uh, and that was uh, rejected uh, by the Court of Appeal. Um, but it somewhat came back, or, or, albeit in modified form, uh, in House of Lords. So one can see at page 1012 uh, D, uh, the um, Lord Stain uh, reciting that each communication is a separate libel. Um, uh, recording the submissions at F and G on that page uh, to treat the entire publication, whether by international newspaper circulation, transborder, or satellite broadcast, or internet posting as if it gives rise to one cause of action, and to ask whether it being clearly proved that this action is best tried in England. And the House of Lords points out there, if counsel was simply submitting that in respect of transnational libels, the court exercising its discretion must consider the global picture, his proposition would be uncontroversial. Counsel was, however, advancing a more ambi ambitious proposition. Uh, he submitted that in respect of transnational libels, the principles enunciated by the House in the Spiliard case should be recast to proceed on assumption that there is, in truth, one cause of action. Uh, the result of such a principle, if adopted, will usually be to favour a, a trial in the home courts of the foreign publisher because the bulk of publication will have taken place there. Um, Council had then submitted, and this is um, perhaps somewhat relevant because this is where we get uh, what is referred to as the rule of Bereshovsky, um, that it was artificial for plaintiffs to confine their claim to the publication within the jurisdiction. Uh, and the House of Lords said this uh, ignores um, the, the authority of Diamond and Sutton. Uh, and the House of Lords' decision uh, relying on Diamond and Sutton has been taken to mean 
that a libel claimant can only get permission to sue about a respective publication in this jurisdiction. Uh, that's certainly how it's always been um, interpreted by libel judges, including Mr Justice Nicklin uh, in Hoover and Wells. Um, I, I should just flag for the court's attention that Mr Justice Saini in the Qatar Airways Group case, which is one of the authorities in the cross appeal, um, certainly doubted that it was correct, at least uh, in respect of malicious falsehood. Is that case going to appeal? I saw. I, I believe it might be, my lady. Mention of that. I, 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 I know the permission was sought, but I, I'm not aware of the permission. Don't think it's been sought. Um, but assuming that the rule in Berejovsky applies, uh, a claimant, including this claimant, can only sue for um, English publication, uh, and it's quite clear that the House of Lords certainly couldn't, I, I think, um, have introduced judicially um, the single tort um, theory, not not least because, um, at least for Brussels cases. Um, uh, splitting up <laughs> publication and damage by jurisdiction to abide by the rule in Chevron's is necessary. So it's not even clear that it would have been um, open. But but that was the, the, the idea that was, was underpinning, that actually if one looked at um, everything as a single tort, um, it, it should be applied to that test. And the House of Lords rejected that. Now, um, Section 9, uh, which is in the authorities bundle, I'm going to uh, ask um, your ladyships and your lordships to turn to tab B, for its, initial, its original enactment, which applies in this case. Certainly doesn't do that. It, 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 it again, probably couldn't, given that um, Brussels regulation applied at the time. It doesn't create a single global tort. But what it did do was uh, make very clear that a court not only was able to look at the wider global picture, as it could have done at common law, but that it had to look at the global picture. It had to consider uh, the places the other fora where the publication was published. That would always be a factor in the mix. And um, perhaps as a sop to the, the difficulties of the rule of Berejovsky, section 9.3 says the references in subsection 2 to the statement complained of include references to any statement which conveys the same or substantially the same imputation as the statement complained of. So if the New York Times publishes an American edition, a European edition, and a Japanese edition, and they're all slightly different, they're slightly differently worded. Um, when the court is considering, as it were, scale of publication of that article by the New York Times, they will all be considered the same statement, notwithstanding that there are some differences between them because it's about the substance. So there is some movement to make sure that the global picture is certainly one of the factors, not a privileged factor, um, for the right there, but it's certainly one of the factors that the court needs to look at in considering whether England and Wales is uh, the most appropriate jurisdiction. Um, so that's where the common law had, had got up to. And we say one of the important features uh, of the common law, and indeed all litigation in our law, is um, there's a, a wonderful German word, uh, which I think is pronounced facultative collisionsrecht, uh, about conflict of laws, which is to say it's only an issue if somebody puts it in. Um, if the parties don't raise uh, an issue, if they don't um, disagree as to the content of foreign law, or they don't disagree that the, um, the court has personal jurisdiction, they, there's really nothing for the court to adjudicate. The courts adjudicate disputes insofar as they're raised by parties. Um, obviously, that would be very, very different if my learned friend was correct and Section 9 considers subject matter jurisdiction. Parties wouldn't be able to agree. It would have to be decided by the court but of its own initiative. If, if the parties didn't raise it. But matters of personal jurisdiction or applicable law um, are, uh, or the content of foreign law are capable of being agreed by the parties. And it's only if they're in dispute that they need to be uh, proven by one or the other of them uh, with, with a certain form of evidence. Um, I just flag before we move on to say that actually one of the most important issues um, could be, and particularly in Section 9 cases will be, where the defendant is domiciled. We can see from section 9.1 that it only applies um, when a person is, as the law currently stands, domiciled outside of the United Kingdom. So even if they were a British defendant, sued by a British claimant, but the British defendant was domiciled abroad, even though they kept a residence here, it could still be um, engaged, uh, because it would be purely on the basis of domicile. Um, and, and indeed, two of the first instance cases that have been on section 9, al Sadiq and Sadiq, my friends already taken you to, but also the more recent case of Kim and Lee, uh, another case before um, Mr Justice Julian Knowles, uh, 
actually, the issue on Section 9 was whether or not it was engaged at all dependent on the defendant's domicile. Um, to, to cut to the chase, our, our answer is that burdens and standards work exactly the same on Section 9.1 as they do on 9.2. The claimant has the legal burden, but the defendant may have an evidential burden if, if the claimant aversed that they are domiciled in the United Kingdom. The defendant might have an evidential burden to say, well, no, I don't live here. I actually live in Dubai or Pakistan or the United States, at which case the legal burden would then fall back on the claimant um, to rebut that. So the, the, the two questions, even uh, assuming that um, Section 9 is engaged by the defendant's domicile, um, will, will then be, is there another candidate forum other than England and Wales which is available to hear the claim? Uh, and if there is, which, which candidate, England and Wales or the other forum, or even multiple fora, is uh, clearly the most appropriate and it has to be England and Wales in order to satisfy Section 9. Could I just um, take a moment out of submissions? I, I noticed that my learned friends um, sort of reformulated a case on, on whether his um, clients are actually parties to this litigation at all. Um, he, he referred to the idea that um, actually Section 9 could be brought up not only later, uh, which would obviously be right if it was subject matter jurisdiction, but, but even again and again in changing circumstances, uh, which we say cannot be right. Um, uh, he, he said it was particularly unfair on the extraordinary facts of this case um, that uh, it should be assessed by a point in time before they were parties. Uh, I would just point out, we, we have included Churney and Deripaska uh, at tab four of the authorities one. Uh, it's, it's only paragraphs nine and 15 for your ladyships and your lordships to know. Um, domicile is determined as at the date of the issue of the claim form. In fact, all issues as to jurisdiction, uh, whether under the Brussels regulation or uh, uh, a common law are determined as at the date of the issue of the claim form. It's a fixed date in time so that people don't change their circumstances or behaviour after the claim form has been issued so as to avoid jurisdiction. Um, that, that's been a long-standing rule. Uh, so it's always the case, if it's issued for received service, it's always the case that um, uh, applies to domicile or, or other factors relevant to whether or not it's within the jurisdiction of the court are determined by a point in time, as it were, before it's been served with originating process. It's always judged by a point in time which is the issue of proceedings. Um, that's been most recently confirmed uh, if further authority was needed at the end of the test in Brangley in the Supreme Court. Uh, Lord Sumption um, notes, in fairness, I think it's the party's agreement uh, that, that this is to be judged as at the time of the issue of there's no particular unfairness with resolving anything by a date before a party served or, or anything else. That's entirely the norm. I'm not quite sure that that's a complete answer to it because it's not merely the date of at which, but the point at which the issue is then resolved. My lady, I was thinking I think more in terms of Mr. Price's argument that, that the facts could change section 9, oh, such that oh, the challenge on section 9 could be brought back in a later point. Well, I'm not point sure he was necessarily confining himself to the facts changing, but the evidential picture might change. Um, as to the facts as they stood at the relevant time, as you say, the issue of the claim form. I mean, um, in, in terms of, so normally speaking, if there was just a, a traditional um, CPR 11 challenge, the, the court would determine or on the evidence, the good arguable case standard, um, the facts as they stood at the date of the issue of the claim form on the basis of the uh, evidence available to the court. I I'm sure that further evidence, if a decision went against a party and they wanted to revisit it because they discovered new evidence relevant to that same date, the date of the issue of the claim form after the determination, your Lordship is quite right that there are ways to reopen or, or to appeal and make uh, a ladder marshal application. Uh, th there was such an attempt in Berezovsky. I mean, that's not uncommon. Uh, it, it doesn't suggest any support for my Lord's Baron's proposition that um, either Section 9 is subject matter jurisdiction, or that a party can have multiple bites of the cherry, or that the, the picture can change over time. That, that might be true of discretionary foreign convenience, now that that's available because Brussels has gone away, but um, a party could always make an application to say, because of this circumstance, now another court is, you know, this should be consolidated with proceedings overseas. Um, but the determination that's made can't, can't be reopened, as we say. Um, so we say the position as it stood at common law before the 
illustration, I, I give the citation for your ladyships and your lordships note. The, 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 the crux of, of what we say is in um, the Supreme Court's decision in Unwired Planet, uh, which is at tab 16, which will be the second volume of authorities. Um, it's page 491 of the electronic bond, uh, bundle of authorities. And um, for those who print, it's uh, paragraphs uh, 96. And it's uh, 96 uh, B. That there was a dispute about the characterization of this is an intellectual property dispute. Uh, there, there was a dispute about the characterization. Uh, but the uh, court continued, but we think, like the judge, that there is a compelling reason why the appellants must fail on this issue, which would apply even if the appellant's characterization had been correct, so that the dispute was in substance about the terms of the Global Friend license. A challenge to jurisdiction on forum convenience grounds requires the challenger to identify some other forum which does have jurisdiction to determine the dispute. Even, so obviously at common law, the legal burden would be on the defendant to show a foreign forum was um, clearly more appropriate. But it's the next sentence that's completely relevant because section nine, the burden is on the claimant show England and Wales, and that's exactly the same as it would be at common law for service out cases. Even in a case where permission is required to serve out of the jurisdiction, so that the burden then shifts to the claimant to show that England is the more appropriate forum, that still requires there to be another candidate with the requisite jurisdiction. In the present case, China is the only candidate which the appellants have put forward. There may be others, but the court is not required to carry out its own independent search, and such other jurisdictions as might exist in theory may not be remotely convenient. After hearing extensive expert evidence, the judge found that the Chinese courts do not at present have jurisdiction to determine the terms of a global friend license, at least in the absence of agreement by all the parties that they should do so. Even in the event of such an agreement, he described the prospect that the Chinese courts would embark on the exercise as no more than speculative. Notwithstanding the admission of fresh evidence on this issue, the Court of Appeal reached the same conclusion. In sharp contrast, we have decided for the reasons above that the English court does have such a jurisdiction even in the absence of consent by the parties, and it is, of course, to exercise that jurisdiction uh, in the unwired case. So then to paragraph 98, um, we therefore agree with the judge that the forum convenience challenge falls at this first hurdle, notwithstanding the fresh evidence uh, adduced in the Court of Appeal. Uh, and there might have been complicated uh, issues under Lewis and Jackson because this was a regulation case. We, we say that the three cases, this is just as Hamlin back in Ashton's Elegant Albemarle in 2010, which is the authority we primarily relied for for Mr. Justice Jay. Livingston, which is an example of, uh, again, a service, it was both a service out and stay case where no other available forum uh, was um, substantiated, even after expert evidence. Uh, and then this uh, very recent decision of um, the Supreme Court makes it quite clear that even in service out cases where the burdens on the claimant to show England and Wales is clearly most appropriate, person who disagrees with that, called the challenger for obvious reasons in, in, in this case, but the person who disagrees with that at least has to say this is the forum or other fora, plural, that are available and might be appropriate, at least to the standards sufficient to defeat the English court's claim. And Mr Justice Hamlin roots it in principle a long line of authority about um, he who asserts must prove uh, and the differences between legal uh, and evidential. And so if there's no alternative forum, then the comparison required by section nine of the right and bed can't be conducted. So that's burden of proof. Common law standard of proof, uh, we, we say is a good arguable case uh, and not a balance of probabilities. Uh, it's in our skeleton argument at paragraphs 42 to 51. Um, volume two of the authorities bundle, we have included Brownlee um, uh, at tab 11 at page 349 of the electronic uh, authorities bundle. And if I could ask the court to turn that up just very, very briefly. Vicar Vice in the House of Lords is not the easiest case to read, uh, but there is uh, an admirable um, summary uh, of its effect uh, by uh, Lord Sumption in Brownlee. I should say, technically, uh, what Lord Sumption says in Brownlee is uh, obita. Um, but the test that he articulated, the, the reformulation of good article case, so it now effectively means 
the better of the argument rather than much the better of the argument. That reformulation, it wasn't clear if the rest of the Supreme Court had agreed. Uh, and so in a subsequent case called Goldman Sachs, he rearticulated it again and, and everybody agreed with it. So there's no doubt that I should just flag that with Brownlee. The discussion in Brownlee, one they were talking about the, the reformulation of good arguable case, uh, which had become quite convoluted. It is discussed at paragraphs four to seven. Um, uh, and if I could just uh, ask um, your leadership and your lordship just to read paragraphs four to seven um, very briefly. One of the reasons for adopting this standard, and the one that most people seem to adhere to, is the risk that the jurisdictional fact will be a fact in issue in the claim itself, so that the rather inadequate preliminary assessment might bind a later court. Um, does that read across to Section 9? It certainly does if Section 9 is a personal jurisdiction uh, provision. Because if Section 9 is a personal jurisdiction provision, then it has to be raised by CPR Part 11 challenge, and it has to be raised, um, uh, failing which it will be deemed waived. And that's a rather question-begging argument. It, it does rather beg the argument. So our, our point is, I think, is this. It, it, if we arrive that it's personal jurisdiction, it's CPR 11, therefore it's at an interlocutory stage, uh, and it's a jurisdiction provision being dealt with at an interlocutory stage, so just like common law quorum convenience, of course it should uh, apply in the same way. The, the reason we say that your lordship is entirely right to apply, by the presence the balance of probabilities on the default judgment cases, we've, we've included in this Justice Butcher in YA2, where, where a court's actually not, there, there is no prospective trial, the court is giving judgment. Any fact um, which needs to be relied upon for the court's jurisdiction to be established, so um, whether it's section 10 or section 9, if the court is giving judgment, um, as it is when it's giving default judgment, it needs to be satisfied to the full civil standard. We accept that. So it, it's not the good arguable case, although good arguable case is the universal standard used in all jurisdiction challenges, because almost all jurisdiction challenges are personal jurisdiction challenges, it's actually the, the logic behind it is because it's being done at an interlocutory stage. There's, there's not the fullness of evidence that there would be post-disclosure, and so there's some degree of flexibility. Um, in but it, it's not an interlocutory decision in the sense that it's a provisional decision on an, on an issue which necessarily arises in the main claim, like an interlocutory injunction. Um, normally, for the reasons you gave earlier, the decision on whether the gateway test is satisfied and the merits test is satisfied will be conclusive. conclusive. Um, it, the, the court is required by authority not to stray into the merits of the claim. Um, I, for, for the reasons that your logic gives, though, it, it shouldn't, for instance, make findings that um, uh, a, a particular thing happened on the civil standard because that issue would be live at trial. And as part of trying to avoid straying into the merits, it only makes it on the good article case. But your logic is quite right. If, for instance, domicile is only relevant for jurisdiction, it's not one of the merits of, uh, not part of the merits of the claim, domicile is no part of the cause of action. Um, it's still done on the basis of good arguable case. It's not just about not trespassing in to the merits and creating an issue of stop for later in the proceedings. It's also about um, recognizing, as Assumption identifies, as, as the Lords did in Vigliche, that there is a limited um, evidential base. Um, there's certainly not going to be disclosure. There won't in 
or with the most extraordinary circumstances be cross-examination, there needs to be a certain limit that the court needs to be sufficiently satisfied that it has jurisdiction um, over the particular defendant for the case to proceed to trial. Um, it's, but isn't that, that's, that's misstating it, surely. The, the jurisdiction exists if the court is sufficiently satisfied. And that's sufficiently the, satisfied That's, that's the order. test for whether there is jurisdiction. And sufficiently satisfied in relation to personal jurisdiction means good article case. Yeah. Uh, unless the court is giving judgment as it is in default judgment, in which case it's balance of probabilities. And we just say it would be it would be a, a, a very unusual thing if if alone of all of the um, jurisdictional challenges that, that could be made, this would be the one instance where there was a different standard of proof. Uh, and even if my own friend was right that sections nine and ten are subject matter jurisdiction or personal jurisdiction. It's very difficult to see why the logic of what Lord Subject says in Brownlee wouldn't apply with equal force, at least insofar as those applications were made at an interlocutory stage. If my learned friend is right that they are both subject matter jurisdiction and the points weren't taken until trial, one actually could have an awful lot of sympathy that actually, if that if it were subject matter jurisdiction, it could not be taken until trial, but is raised at trial, and the court is deciding a trial. I think we'd, we'd accept that at that point, if that was possible, balance probabilities might be appropriate. Well, that's what um, Mr. Justice Julian Knowles envisaged in Sadiq. He, he, Mr. Justice Julian Knowles envisaged it in Sadiq because he's the one judge. We, we say Mr. Justice Jay certainly didn't, but Mr. Justice Julian Knowles clearly did decide unequivocally that, that it was subject matter jurisdiction. Yeah. The, the countervailing view, um, we say, is given at least elliptically by Mr Justice Nicklin at the end of the first instance decision in right and there. Um, I, I say elliptically because it was the, the argument was put slightly differently by Mr Tomlinson you see that um, uh, as I understand it that um, section 9 somehow needs to be satisfied before even the claim form was issued yeah. uh, and Mr Justice Nicklin says no to that but at paragraph 58 um, Roman 3 I think it is he, he sets out that the, the appropriate way for um, uh, challenges under section 9 of the act to be resolved is the CPR 11 route uh, and in doing so he adopts whether he uh, he didn't refer to Hodnot but he essentially adopts the reasoning of the Hodnot rule which is to say that uh, a defendant is entitled to raise whatever jurisdictional personal jurisdictional challenges he likes but if he fails to do so there's a consequence to that um, so, so there is that first instance conflict um, finally on, on the common law um, there wasn't really a dispute below because the parties uh, agreed that no judicial notice could be given and we've, we've included um, of, of the content of foreign law so we, we've included Dicey uh, chapter 9 which uh, the judge was taken through uh, pretty much in full um, below um, there, there was no agreement I mean there couldn't be agreement because there were no propositions of foreign law um, to agree because the defendants never identified which foreign law or which court's uh, jurisdiction was going to be in dispute. So absent uh, there even being another forum identified, let alone shown uh, by evidence or agreement to be available, there, there couldn't then be a discussion of what law it would apply, what remedies would be available, how, how things would work, even what the applicable law would be. Um, so uh, the summary, what we say of the common law, is that uh, foreign law companions is always a facet of personal jurisdiction challenges. The evidential burden, uh, sorry, the legal burden falls on the claimants in service out, show England and Wales, but defendants uh, in um, stay applications. Uh, the common law standard is always a good article case for whoever needs to prove something, and expert evidence is always required to show, um, to, to, to prove common law. So turning then to section 9, which is in the authorities bundles at tab B, page 35 of the electronic. We accept that Section 9 massively changes the situation where the service has a right uh, on a foreign domicile defendant, because now the burden is always on claimants uh, and always to show that England and Wales is clearly the most appropriate uh, place, for trial, uh, place to bring an action, rather than for the trial of the action. Um, so it makes less difference, obviously, in a service out case, because service out claimants always have the burden of showing uh, England and Wales was clearly the most appropriate. So there, there shouldn't be an enormous difference um, in, in the service out case as opposed to the uh, service as right cases. Well, if that's right, then it hasn't achieved anything much or anything of the objectives that everyone agrees it had, which was to do something about 
claims against foreigners. Well, I mean, I mean you, well, you, you rightly point out that, of course, um, there's no there's no um, match between foreigners and people who can be who have to be served out or in. That's that's a point, but the reality is, there are most people who are not domiciled here do not make themselves available for service. No. Um, there, 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 there would be. I, I think that's right. Paul. I think the, the the difference in the um, service as of right cases, so foreign bureaus, people who happen to be here, uh, uh, and the rest of it. There's a huge difference there. That's uh, the difference would be somewhat more muted, I accept, on service out cases. But I think that perhaps does underplay not how revolutionary, but quite how significant sections nine two and nine three could actually be. Um, so, firstly, it, it sort of guarantees that the court will look at the global picture, and we'll see from the explanatory notes. I mean, the example given is that the statement has been published a hundred thousand times in Australia and only five thousand in England. You know, that that would be a major factor. Now. It, it might not have been a factor that commanded particular force at Commonwealth. The, the court could look to the global picture. Section 9.2 requires the court to look at places of publication and scale of publication as a factor. It certainly brought it into much sharper relief. But one of the things it's certainly done, um, uh, and this makes sense in terms of the harm to reputation, is that where there has been publication, but not quite of the same statement, but similar statement, uh, and I would notice that in terms, section 9.3 doesn't even refer to similar statements by the same defendant. But where there have been similar publications, or publications of a similar sting elsewhere around the world, and thus damage to reputation around the world, the court is to look at common law, whilst it could have an eye to the global picture, it was fundamentally bound by the four corners of the pleaded case, the statements in England and Wales, and where it was best to try the action on the four corners of the case. The question asked by section 9.2 is having regard to the places of publication and the available fora where the claimant could sue, not only on these statements but on similar statements that have caused the same harm to his reputation anywhere in the world, where is the appropriate place for him to bring the action? And so the fact that if there had been 100,000 publications in New York but only 5,000 in London, it might well be that that was a fairly small part of the global picture that a common law court looked at on common law foreign convenience. But now the court is asking the question, well, there was so much more publication in New York, and it is uh, an available jurisdiction. The question is not where is the place that's clearly most appropriate to try the claim of English publication that's pleaded, it's where to bring the action. And in that sense, that is a, a relatively radical departure. It's not as radical as something like single thought theory, and it certainly has less effect on service out than service as of right cases. But it's still quite a substantial retilting of the balance, especially when we consider that section 9 should also be read in conjunction with section 1. So whereas previously uh, foreign defendants who were essentially trying to resist on the basis of no real than subsisting tort in the jurisdiction, really it was those cases with only five publishers, as in Jamil, who would escape. The section 1 threshold raising to make it harder to show a real uh, tort committed in the jurisdiction has itself done an awful lot to, to mute libel tourism. Section 9 is almost filling out the sides, as it were. The explanatory notes um, can be found at um, page 60 of the electronic bundle, uh, which, uh, and at the end of the act as it currently stands uh, in tab C, uh, it's internal page 60 of the bundle. Uh, in the bottom right hand corner. <clears throat> Paragraphs 65, 66, and 67 are the relevant um, parts of the explanatory note. Um, 65, uh, this section aims to address the issue of libel tourism, uh, a term which is used to apply where cases with a tenuous link to England and Wales are brought in this jurisdiction uh, and explains the basis for engagement based on Brussels and Ghana. Paragraph 66, um, it explains the test, uh, and, and your ladyships and your lordship will see halfway down the paragraph, where it says, this would mean that, for example, if a statement was published 100,000 times in Australia, parenthetically, I'd say, uh, a, a case which could be tried in the federal courts of Australia, so you can consider the country as one, uh, 100,000 times in Australia and only 5,000 times in England, that would be a good basis upon which to conclude that the most appropriate jurisdiction in which to bring an action in respect to the statement was Australia rather than England. 
However, there will be a range of factors which the court may wish to take into account, including, for example, the amount of damage to the claimant's reputation in this jurisdiction compared to elsewhere, the extent to which publication was targeted uh, at a readership in this jurisdiction. That was a fact that very much deprecated by the Court of Appeal in King and Lewis, but is to be back if the notes are right. Uh, and whether there's reason to think that a claimant would not receive uh, a fair hearing elsewhere. I mean, very much reads like foreign companions um, rather than the whole new code. Now, paragraphs 65 and 66 make their way into the judgments of Sir Michael Tugendhat and Ahuja. Uh, and you've already seen from my learned friend that they make their way uh, into the decision of Mr. Justice Julian Knowles in uh, Al Sadiq and Sadiq. He actually quoted paragraphs 65 and 66 in his judgment before finding that there was, uh, it was a question of subject matter jurisdiction. Paragraph 67, though, I suggest is actually the most relevant of these three paragraphs. Um, after describing subsection 3, the similar statements count as the statement, it, it goes on to say in the final sentence, it is the intention that this new rule will be capable of being applied within the existing procedural framework for defamation claims. Now, the existing procedural framework for defamation claims in this context can only mean CPR parts 6, 11, suppose 53 to the extent that it's relevant. If what Parliament was trying to do here was to create uh, an entirely new jurisdictional regime, actually ousting subject matter jurisdiction, albeit in a class of cases defined by a particular person's domicile or a particular person's status uh, in invol involvement in the publication. But strangely, Parliament was pegging a subject matter jurisdiction ouster to personal characteristics. One might have expected that perhaps they wouldn't expect claims to be dealt with in the existing procedural framework, CPR Part 6 and CPR Part 11, which do deal exclusively in personal jurisdiction, which can be waived and indeed will be deemed waived. By I mean, putting quite a lot of weight on those words, isn't it? Because they, those are not provisions that have to do with defamation claims. They're, they're, there's not a natural description of Part 11 that is part of the existing procedural framework for defamation claims unless you're going to embrace the entire CPR, which are also part of the existing framework for defamation claims and others. I suppose it is. I mean, Section 9, the crosshead of Sections 9 and 10 is jurisdiction. Mm. Um, section 9 is um, determining whether it's engaged based entirely on the territorial delineation of domicile. It's aping the test from Old Timo about the appropriate place to bring a claim. It's referring to clearly most appropriate, which is the wording of common law forum convenient. Um, and the explanatory notes are saying the existing, the existing procedural framework should, should remain the same. If it's a toss-up between is this a modification of forum convenience for the libel claims, or is it a, a, a brand new subject matter exclusion, which there's no reason to use actually the existing procedural gateways that would apply in CPR Part 6 or 11. This is a jurisdiction provision that exists outside of the jurisdiction provisions in the CPR, there's no textual support for that. Uh, there's nothing that's been indicated from Hansard. It's certainly not clear from the face of the statute. The only support for it is that Mr. Julian Knowles' instinct was that it was subject matter, not personal. But as I say, that was on the basis that he quoted 65 and 66, but doesn't appear at least to have had his attention drawn to 67, which is very much closer to the instincts of Mr. Justice Nicklin at the end of Wright and Fair. Um, my scattered argument at paragraphs 59 to 65 it explains uh, a little more uh, the impact of sections um, 9.2 and 9.3, and I'm, I'm not going to go back to that. I would like to very briefly, if I may, turn to the only court of appeal authority on section 9, uh, which is uh, right and there in volume 2 of the authorities at tab 15. Uh, it starts at page uh, 441. The easiest place to find uh, the, the grounds of appeal is uh, in the head note. Uh, and it's really the second ground of appeal. Uh, 
I'm sorry. Page 441. It's page 3915 of the Weekly Law Reports report. Um, uh, an appeal from Nick and Jade, going down to um, uh, next to letter F. Uh, one of the grounds of appeal uh, was that the judge had wrongly failed to carry out a comparative assessment uh, as to whether each candidate jurisdiction was potentially appropriate for the claim, despite that being a task mandated by Section 9. Now, there was expert evidence in writing there at the first instance, I understand, um, uh, showing that the courts of uh, it was California, New York, and possibly one other state were um, uh, available to hear the claim. Uh, and on the basis that um, Mr. Justice Nicolay found that he, he just couldn't conduct a, a, a comparison, uh, he didn't feel that he could, that was the second grant of appeal. And that prompted a respondent's notice, which can be seen at G. Uh, essentially, the defendant sought to uphold the judge's decision on the basis that if a comparative assessment was required by Section 9, England and Wales was not clearly the most appropriate place um, compared to the United States. Um, heading into Lord Justice Dingman's judgment uh, at um, paragraph uh, 45. References the judge uh, considering the evidence, including expert legal evidence, on whether a US court would accept jurisdiction over the claim. Um, a lot has been devoted to the question of whether the US is in fact the most appropriate jurisdiction. I do not need to decide this issue. Uh, and that was a statement back um, to uh, his statement that a claimant could fail to surmount the evidential hurdle even if the court is unable to identify from the other candidate jurisdictions an alternative that is most appropriate. That, that's clearly right. If there are two other candidates or three other candidates other than England and Wales, uh, and the, the court doesn't need to find which of them is most, it's the claimant's burden to show that England and Wales is clearly the most. That's obviously correct. Um, uh, and there had been consent from Mr. Fair uh, as to um, uh, the fact that the claim could be brought against him um, in uh, the US. Um, at paragraphs 48 to 49, this is the second round of appeal. The judge had wrongly failed to carry out uh, a comparative assessment uh, and the respondent's notice. And then moving forward to paragraph um, 51. This is the reference to Lord Sumption in the show at paragraph 13. Established principle of construction that Parliament is taken to have known what the law was prior to enactment. Uh, the other maxim in, in that paragraph, Lord Sumption's judgment, that Parliament uh, doesn't demand the common law more than is necessary. And then turning ahead to um, paragraph uh, 58, uh, there's the reference to the earlier cases of Hooja, Hooder and Wells, Sadik and Sadik. And then over at paragraph 60, uh, and this is really the, the, the meat of the judgment. In these circumstances, in my judgment, section 9 requires that where a defendant is not domiciled in the UK or at present a member state or party of the Ghana Convention, the party bringing the claim will need to satisfy a court on the balance of probabilities, we'll come back to that a bit later, that of all the places in which a statement and claim has been published in England and Wales is clearly the most appropriate place in which to bring an action, this will require the court to assess a number of different factors. Uh, and he says relevant factors will include the best evidence available to show all the places in inverted commas, which in this context means jurisdictions, in which the relevant statement has been published, see Ahuja, uh, and, and notes uh, section 9.3. Uh, um, he then widens the scope of the factors. He didn't agree with the sort of a two-stage approach by looking at places of publication and then um, other factors. He was right on that following uh, BTB. Um, uh, he then describes the judge's approach. Um, but it's paragraph 69 where he says, I agree that in some cases a judge may be unable to say which is the most appropriate jurisdiction which to bring the claim. It's also clear that the decisive issue is whether England and Wales is clearly the most appropriate jurisdiction. However, I agree with Mr. Wolanski that the judge had to confront Dr. Wright's evidence. He had only visited the US for two and a half days in the last four years. And also his evidence that the vast majority of his business peers were in the UK. Except the submission that it was possible to make an assessment of whether the US was the most appropriate jurisdiction. Uh, it's therefore necessary for this court to consider for itself whether England and Wales is clearly the most appropriate. So we say ratio is there does need to be a comparative assessment of the uh, available candidate jurisdictions, and, and that comparison has to be done according to the factors that are um, delineated. Uh, and they're delineated predominantly between paragraphs 61 and 68. When I began my submissions, um, I said that if uh, section 9 is to be understood against the background of the common law, 
there were four major issues. Uh, type of jurisdiction, burden of proof, standard of proof, mechanism of proof. Uh, and in each case, you'd have to ask, how has Section 9 changed uh, the, the common law position? Because that's what it was doing when it was amending the um, defamation. I'm actually going to take them in reverse order, because um, that means that we start with the easiest and then we get to the most difficult. Um, so I'm going to start with mechanism, then do standard, then burden, uh, and, and then finally type. Um, we don't think there's actually any dispute about mechanism of proof. Whoever bears the burden of showing that alternative fora are available, uh, we appear to agree, that, or the parties appear to agree, that this must be done, if not by agreement, then by expert evidence. So um, my own friend's skeleton argument, um, uh, and, and he repeated this um, in his oral submission, refers to uh, another, can, another available candidate emerging um, that doesn't really answer the question. It, it begs the question, how, how does it emerge? Who puts it in issue? Who has to say this non-England and Wales forum is available so that the comparison can be um, conducted? Um, but what we don't appear to agree on is that unless there's agreement, no judicial notice can be taken. So whether, for instance, the courts of Texas can hear a claim by an alien against people domiciled in other member states what law a, ju a federal judicial district in Texas might apply, would it apply Texas law or would it apply law of the court, what remedies there might be, what mode of trial. Those questions of foreign law have to be decided by expert evidence and not agree. And right. I don't understand so, the parties. Mr. Powers, can I just interrupt for a second just to ask you about that? Um, my understanding has always been, and it's um, to some extent confirmed by um, Rule 25, Sub Rule 2, in Chapter 9 of Dicey, which is in the bundle at um, Big Roman, Tab Big Roman 1, that yes. if there isn't satisfactory evidence about foreign law, the court will apply English law to such a case. And I'm just wondering how that fits into a case where there isn't very satisfactory evidence of foreign law, as appears to be the picture in this case. Yes, my lady. It's certainly true that in considering the substance the applicable law of, let's say, a tort, or it, it could equally be a contract. But um, if the court is looking at the applicable substantive law, um, where uh, the, the parties can either uh, agree what the content of it, um, and the party who has, as it were, the initial legal burden of proving what foreign law as fact actually is, um, is entitled in the first instance to rely on what's called the presumption of identity. So you just yeah. assume it's the same as English law unless someone puts it in issue and, and says it's not. There's been a recent decision of this case, a follow-up uh, decision in this court in, in Brownlee about who bears that, that burden. Yeah. That can certainly be true for the purposes of what is Texas law on defamation or, or indeed what is Californian law on defamation or Saudi Arabian law of contract you, you, because English law can be applied as the substantive applicable law. Yeah. The difficulty here is that the foreign law that really the, the court needs to look at is firstly a binary question as to whether or not, according to its own conflict of law rules, mm -hmm. a foreign court would have jurisdiction to hear a particular claim. Yeah. So it, imagine that the defendants that identified the state of Texas. Could the court in Texas hear a claim by a, a non-US citizen domiciled abroad, uh, and could it hear it against one or all or only some of the defendants? Uh, and that might be different between state courts. So the, the question of the jurisdiction of the foreign court applying its own conflict of law rules is the first part. Mm -hmm. The second part is applying its own conflict of law rules, what would be the substantive law that it would apply? Yeah. Um, and that's very important because as Lady Arden um, points out in uh, Livingston at uh, paragraph 12, following on from Lord Manson vis a Neutrodeck, the governing law of the cause of action is a major factor in any uh, assessment of appropriate. Uh, and particularly in an area like this where there's no particular harmonisation uh, of the law of personality rights. So, uh, and the third thing that, that would need to be understood is essentially the procedural law, which, which, by which I also mean the law of remedies. So yeah. does that foreign court um, have trial by judge alone or jury? Does it have cost shifting? What remedies available? Damages almost always are, but what form of injunctive relief is available? These are all questions of foreign law, and it is not one of those, it's not the type of question upon which um, an English court can say, well, we presume 
that California law is the same as ours. Because, for instance, our law as to whether or not a court has jurisdiction, for instance, for years has been governed by the Brussels regulation. It's almost impossible to say, well, you know, the rules around allocation of jurisdiction in the Brussels regulation should just be applied to California in the absence of any evidence to the contrary. Because you couldn't apply the Brussels regulation because it's not a member state. So these aren't questions, we say, that actually can be satisfactorily resolved by the presumption of identity. Well, might the position be that some could and some couldn't? I mean, some self-evident you can't, as you say, like the Brussels regulation. But what about other questions that aren't governed by something like the Brussels regulation? Could any of them? The difficulty is it's not just a – so in the example where there's a trial about something that happened in Germany and there's a dispute of, you know, the parties perhaps agree or perhaps they don't agree that the applicable law of the tort would be German. To a certain extent, that's substantive law, but the English court can try the case according to English law and just presume that it's the same. Here, this isn't just looking at foreign law. It's looking at foreign conflicts of law rules. I would have thought it would be incredibly difficult to try and work out how you could just transplant English conflicts of law rules to California. For instance – Was there any authority on this point? None that immediately comes to mind. I certainly wouldn't say that there isn't. There is no authority that jumps to mind on this question. If the position were otherwise, I suppose you might say that somebody making – like trying to – a case just disappears into the ether because the English court confidently asserts that another jurisdiction has – is a more appropriate one. And if an attempt is made then to bring the claim there, the jurisdiction is refused. It turns out that it's not. There's never going to be a perfect system. But money, that's exactly – The court is not saying you can't have a – you can't bring a claim. The question is where should it be brought? And that's why we say it's quite important that – I mean, the claimant is in these circumstances always saying that the claim should – is within the English court's jurisdiction and should be brought here. This is exactly why we say – and it's the reasoning of Mr. Justice Hamlin and Aldemar. This is exactly why there's a burden on – a mere evidential burden, not the legal burden, but an evidential burden on defendants to identify that other forum. If the defendants had put in their response that three out of the five of them live in California and they think that California is the most appropriate burden and the Californian court can hear cases against those domiciled in other states and they had boldly asserted that. I mean, there's an interesting question whether a party would dispute whether California can hear claims against its own citizens. It's more complicated perhaps as to whether it could hear it against others. But at least at that point, the claimant bearing the legal burden of proof could have adduced expert evidence on California law to show why it couldn't be brought in California against half the defendants and why California law didn't give available remedies and why it was inappropriate. The problem with my learned friend's proposition that there is no evidential burden whatsoever on defendants is that the claimant, who certainly at the time of ex parte application for service, has absolutely no idea where there has been publication in what volumes. It might trace the domiciles of the defendants, but not necessarily so. It depends on the subject matter as much as the place of the publisher. The claimant cannot be expected to adduce the availability, and we say it has to be done with expert evidence, of various other fora where there might have been publication. It's entirely appropriate. There's a limited evidential burden on defendants to say this is an alternative. Here is the expert evidence that it is available, and now the comparison can take place and there can be responsive evidence. And we say without that evidential burden, the court will inevitably be left in circumstances that somebody could say, well, there's been enormous publication in Nigeria, but nobody in this case has any particular links to Nigeria, and we have no expert evidence as to whether Nigeria could hear the claim. What's the court then to make of that? Nobody's managed to establish that it is an available alternative candidate, so how can the comparison with Nigeria be conducted? And that's why we say it makes far more sense if the common law foreign convenience way of doing this is applied in exactly the same way in Section 9 cases. All that had to happen here was the defendants had to pick one or maybe more. They might have said California and New York, and then put in what could be quite limited expert evidence. DSIC put in very limited 
And that expert evidence, Mr. Justice Johnson said, the state court would be available, but Israel is not, and the U.S. federal court is not available. And they were Mr. Justice Johnson's findings of fact, but the state court in Washington was available because it was only D6 and he was domiciled there. These defendants didn't identify anywhere. They didn't put in any evidence, expert or otherwise, as to the availability of another forum. But they do suggest that expert evidence might be required because their skeleton argument 25 to 27 says, well, there might be an evidential burden that requires expert evidence which would fall on claimants. And we say that's just simply unworkable. Might there be a more flexible approach? Suppose, this is quite an unreal supposition, but suppose a claimant chose to sue some relatively impecunious media defendants who were domiciled abroad. And they said, well, it's terribly unfair. We've got to shoulder the burden of all this. Here's a passage from a nutshell guide to the law of California. It says that foreigners can sue residents of California without limitation for anything they do anywhere in the world. Show why you shouldn't do that. You shoulder the burden. You're the wealthy businessman. That discharges the defendant's evidential burden. Evidential burden is... In the circumstances of such a case. I think it's flexible. The court always has a certain degree of flexibility as to what evidence it admits and what it accepts and what weight it gives to it. And I think once the forum is identified and there's at least some basis, even if it was in just lay witnesses' evidence from a solicitor for the party, that a particular forum would be available, at least you're right. At that point, in reply, the claimant could have used its own expert evidence showing why it wasn't available or why it was manifestly less appropriate. Because that would avoid you flailing around trying to show that of all the places in all the world, I've got to come into your court. We say it's a modest evidential burden. The other way, it's not the only... I should be clear. Expert evidence is not the only way. It's normally done by agreement. I mean, parties don't want to have an expensive fight about expert evidence. If it's not done by agreement, expert evidence, there is also a mechanism under Civil Evidence Act. I think it's Section 4. And it refers to a notice where there's been a point of foreign law that's been decided, I think, in a reported English case, and that can sort of be adduced rather than expert evidence. But there has to be... We say there's just a very modest evidential burden to identify another forum and to tell the court that it is, in fact, available. And that wasn't... Even at the end of the hearing, the defendants here were not prepared to identify a forum. But that's not... I'm not sure that necessarily follows from the language of Section 9, Subsection 2, does it? Anyway. From the language of the section, my lady. Hmm. Subsection 2. Sorry, I'm just bringing it up, my lady. Unless the court is satisfied that of all the places in which the statement complained of has been published, England and Wales is clearly the most appropriate place in which to bring an action in respect of the statement. Now, the natural... I mean, I'm not... As you probably know, I'm not a defamation specialist at all, but at first glance, that seems to me to be saying, if you want to sue in respect of something that's been published in different places, you show us that England and Wales is the most appropriate place in which to bring an action. Certainly, that's the legal burden. But I return to the question, certainly when the claim is going ex parte, if it's the New York Times, they might well know, and they might well just be able to say, it's the New York Times, we know that they sell 80% of their newspapers in New York, and here's some expert evidence on New York law as to why New York is available, but it's very inappropriate. We couldn't get any of the remedies we need. But in a case like this, where we're suing a relatively new online-only outlet, it would be almost impossible to forecast which jurisdictions, which would be states of the US, but also countries in the European Union, places overseas, Australia, Canada, and their territories and states, where there was... I think we've almost taken it on a sort of sufficiency of publication as being at least comparable with England and Wales, that there should there be sort of a short list of maybe only eight or nine places that there was significant publication, that then a claimant ex parte should go and get expert evidence as to the availability or otherwise, and appropriateness or otherwise, of that foreign jurisdiction. We say it makes far more sense... Well, it's a bit artificial, really, isn't it? Because the starting point for all of this is the reputation of the claimant, because that's what he or she is going to be complaining about, the injury to reputation. So the starting point must be where the claimant has a reputation. 
if the claimant is not unknown outside this country, that's pretty much all they have to say. I don't care where this has been published in the world because I'm not known there, and it doesn't bother me. Well, I, in fairness, that, that's... I, <laughs> I could go my over a prison, but that, that's almost what we did say. I mean, the, yeah. the evidence in this case, Mr. Justice Jake found, I think it's paragraph 76, we were a ghost online. Obviously, my client has dual citizenship, and, and, and he's you know mentioned his both his properties in litigation. He has some family in Israel who are moving here. But his position was, my entire life, you know, like my entire personal life and my companies are in England and Wales. Um, I obviously have this part of my life in Israel, but that's previously found it's not foreign convenience. Um, when the defendants show up, I'm sure they'll tell me that all the publication was in a particular state in the US, it's convenient for them, uh, and, and that's where it should be. But your Honour is entirely right. He's, he, he did it on the basis of, without knowing the publication numbers, there's almost no claimants ever will um, in advance, where his reputation had been injured. He can only sue in respect of England and Wales. Um, and you, you put forward the events where there's England and Wales, here are the other places I've sued, but Ireland was because tech giants, and Israel has already said it's foreign or convenient. But it's quite interesting because uh, um, I was just reading paragraph 9.002 of IC. Um, there are all sorts of implications, potential implications, from the party's failure to plead and prove foreign law. Um, and they might feed through into various different aspects of the case. So, for example, um, if you take the point that my Lord or Justice Warby has just made about reputation, if nobody's pleaded and proved foreign law, one might be in a position where one's assuming that um, the evidence in this case would be sufficient to show that that's the only place, really, where you would be suing. Um, and that might that might be the beginning and the end of it. Um, and I'm just thinking out loud. Really. It, your nature is quite right. Be very, in some sense, it's very favourable for, for a person like my client who has his centre of interest here. If we could just assume that the substantive law necessary for there to be an actual tort in every jurisdiction included serious harm. But then you run you run the risk that the defendants will then go, well okay, but we don't have, we don't introduce expert evidence and show that you're wrong. But it, it, it's I think it's slightly more complicated simply than that if you fail to plead and prove foreign law, um, that's did, that, that necessarily dishes the defendants. I mean it might depend on the issues that are um, that, that people have failed to plead plead and prove on the law about. Um, I see, I see goes on to say, recently there's increasing signs this can't invariably follow cases where it would be wholly artificial to apply the rule of English law, and I think this is your point about the Brussels regulation, or may simply regard a party who pleaded but failed to prove on the law with insufficient specificity as to allow an English court simply to apply as having failed to establish the case. So, um, yeah. Anyway, sorry, I've, I've slightly taken off track. No, Malay, it's, it's a good part. I, I'm now deeply regretting saying that a mechanism of proof is the easiest of the four. I'm, I'm slightly terrified. Can I just raise a, one, one other tweak just um, on, on what um, is meant by the words the most appropriate place in which to bring an action in respect of the statement? I, I, I'm not sure this is as straightforward as it might look either. Um, we know that the statement encompasses all versions same or similar statements, wherever they are published. Um, but as a matter of English, it's not appropriate to bring an action here in order to vindicate your reputation worldwide. We know that. Um, that's an abuse of the process of the court or a disproportionate intrusion into freedom of speech. Um, presumably, the court must take that into account in considering whether um, a, an action in California uh, would be an appropriate action in respect of the statement. Um, one must be one of the factors because it couldn't be an appropriate place in order to vindicate your reputation somewhere other than California. Exactly. Well, I mean, the territorial scope of the California court, the initial foreign law, needs discussing. Can the California court give give a remedy in respect of English publication at all, or, or would we write it off? There's there's also the question Lord, about section nine three and, and the greater model whether it only refers by similar statements by the same defendant. Yeah. One would take an expansive view and say it's similar statements by, by <laughs> other defendants of what you're actually looking for is sort of cumulative harm. One of the, the features in evidence in this case is that the reporting by the defendants was picked up by the Telegraph newspaper and you know, published to an absolutely extraordinary audience compared to the relatively small numbers of 
this. Now, if, if similar statements encompasses those by third parties, we say it doesn't really matter because my client's centre of interest is here and this is the centre of the harm to its reputation on any analysis, however widely or narrowly you, you draw section 9.3. Certainly, if similar statements by third parties to the same effect were, were, were brought in to look at the statement and where it had been published and where it caused damage to reputation, we would have been able to, to rely on that. Um, so that was a mechanism of proof. Um, I'm going to take standard of proof quite quickly because we, we, we have already discussed the, the issue of um, default judgment and, and entering judgment. Um, it, it does bear uh, explaining how it was that Lord Justice Dingerman's in right and fair came to say it was the balance of probabilities. Um, the, the answer for those who are uh, interested in the granularities in the post-hearing submissions uh, in the supplementary uh, bundles, volume three, tabs 10 to 12. They're quite short, um, but the, the potted history is this. Um, uh, counsel who had appeared at the first instance in Brighton Fair put in four grounds of appeal against Mr Justice Nicklin's decision. The first of those was to say that Mr Justice Nicklin had wrongly applied a standard of proof higher than the balance of probabilities. That was the only ground of the four that was refused by Lord Justice Henderson and his order is at uh, tab 11 who said that Mr Justice Nicklin had quite rightly applied the balance of probabilities, not expressly, but it was implicit he had done so, so he refused permissions on that ground. Uh, refusal permissions of this court are not binding precedent, as the um, citations in the footnotes and those things. Um, when it came before the Court of Appeal on the three grounds that did get permission, um, the error had that, by that point been spotted, Brownlee, Goldman Sachs, or the case or on good article case was put before the court. Um, uh, but the court asked whether there was an amendment to the grounds of appeal, which there wasn't. It, it just didn't make any difference on the facts. And so there was no amendment to the grounds, uh, and Lord Justice Stinkman's, uh, in passing, happened to mention that the standard of proof was the balance of probabilities. Um, that, that's how that came to be, and that's all set out in, in the written submissions uh, that before Mr Justice Jade that persuaded him that the appropriate test was balance of uh, probability. Um, our submissions on this can be taken very briefly. Um, Clearly, as part of clearly most appropriate place uh, to bring the claim, was always part of the common law form of convenience uh, test, and it's part of the test in CPR um, 637. The section 9 is still tracing the common law and, uh, and CPR uh, uh, applicable standards. There's, there's nothing in the text of section 9 that indicates a, a change of standard of proof uh, from good article case to balance of probabilities in either sections 9 or 10. Uh, we say this is a, a case where Black Lawson applies, the Parliament's not changed the common law more than it needs to. We, we say the good policy reasons for applying good article case to interlocutory jurisdiction applications, whatever the basis of jurisdiction, um, it is set out in Vicar Beach and Brownlee. Uh, and we say it's an error to rely, as my learned friend did uh, in the court below, his submissions are at tab 12 of the supplementary bundle. It's an error to rely on your lordship's uh, decisions in Pertek and Brett Wilson on section as giving any sucker to the basis that it should be the balance of probabilities because the reason that those decisions are on the balance of probabilities is because they were default judgment cases uh, and the analysis by Mr Justice Butcher in YA2 is, is compelling on that um, so we say there's no textual support for it there's no uh, authority except for that throwaway line by Lord Justice Dingman's in Right and Bear uh, which is obiter uh, and no other policy justification um, on burden of proof, then, on section 9, uh, you already have my submissions uh, about challenges bearing a, a, a relatively modest evidential burden. Uh, and Mr Justice Jay's uh, refusal of permission to appeal uh, is a core bundle, tab 11, page A142. Uh, he said, Power 154 of the judgment raised an issue of law which is novel. I applied the authorities cited by Mr Callis on the forum, that is to say, Albemarle and... Uh, uh, Albemarle and Livingston, um, because I could see no difference for these purposes between Forum and Section 9, uh, no real prospect of success. Um, we've already said, text of Section 9-2 makes clear that the legal burden on appropriateness of England and Wales always falls on the claimant trying to bring the claim here. Um, nothing in the text of Section 9 uh, indicates how all the places in which the statement was published, how those places can be introduced as potential candidates and their availability established. It's, it's silent on um, the application again of Black Lawson 
um, suggests that the common law is unamended, so it falls to the challenger, the person who resists in any way, shape, or form the assertion of England and Wales being clearly the most appropriate forum. Whoever disputes that um, is the challenger and bears the uh, evidential burden to show that somewhere else is available because he asserts was true. Uh, and we say again, the defendant is a far better position to put in that evidence as to where there has been publication or what fora will be uh, applicable. And bear in mind, one of the, or well, several of the issues on forum conveniences fall down to um, where witnesses will be, where available and relevant evidence will be. That depends entirely on what defences the defendants intend to run. Do they intend to run truth or public interest? Um, where their particular witnesses might be, um, or, or whatever material that they want to rely on. They'll also be familiar with um, uh, their own jurisdiction more so than they are with England and Wales. So they are just better suited as a matter of policy to at least raise and identify the available evidence. Uh, and the claimant doesn't have that knowledge. Uh, and we say that there's a parallel with how engagement of Section 9 works in Section 9.1. Um, the claimant will bear the legal burden of establishing personal jurisdiction by domicile of the defendant in the UK. But the defendant can then evidentially say, no, I don't live in the UK. Section 9 is engaged. And then the defendant has the claimant has the legal burden of, of disproving that. We say that engagement of Section 9, which has been the thorny issue in Kim and Lee, Sadik and Sadik works exactly the same way. And so it's, it's against that. The defendant's case in their skeleton argument, paragraph 25, really begs the question on the problem. They say so, it's. So, sorry to interrupt again, Mr. Powell. Oh, so, so, how does claim discharge the legal burden? By making an assertion, a fair assertion in, in the witness statement. Is that good enough? I think on domicile, it would be. I mean, this case is slightly like difficult because there was never any dispute about anyone's domicile. Sure. So we, we, we pleaded and proved by, by evidence their domicile. In, in the cases where it has been an issue, so Kim and Lee and El Sadik and El Sadik, it would be for the claimant to plead and, and prove. It might not take an awful lot, but they would at least have sort of a ver, I would say that the, the defendant they were suing was domiciled in the United Kingdom. Um, they would have to do that because they have the legal burden of, of establishing the court's personal jurisdiction over a defendant. Oh. And one of the bases of personal jurisdiction is that they're domiciled here. If the defendant said, no, in fact, I, as they did not say, I, I actually moved to Dubai the week before you issued the claim form, um, the defendant will then have an evidential burden of, of, of putting that in issue. But once the evidential burden has been raised so that Section 9 is engaged, the legal burden falls on the claimant. We say that's that's how it works, uh, and that would be in parallel with how it worked under the Brussels regulation. Um, so, Chirney and Deripaska is the example. The basis of domicile was that it uh, was said to be that Mr. Deripaska was domiciled here. Mr. Chirney claims that, Mr. Deripaska refutes that, and then um, the burden falls back on the claimant. Because ultimately, the claimant, like in Section 10 cases, the claimant has to establish that the court has personal jurisdiction over a particular defendant. We say there's a real problem in the defendant's um, appellant's skeleton argument at paragraph 25, because this is the quote, it was for the claimant to satisfy the court, having regard to all the circumstances, that England and Wales was the most appropriate place. And it's this part. And if, given the circumstances of the case, another candidate jurisdiction emerged, the burden remained on C to equip the court to undertake the comparison. It doesn't grapple with the question, how does it And if, as we say, Section 9 is a modification of the common law, there's already an answer for that. The Supreme Court in Unwired, Hamlin and Albemarle, there's, there's a very clear answer to that. If my learned friend is right, and Section 9 is an entirely new code outside of CPR 11 and, and the existing procedural mechanisms, um, it's subject matter jurisdiction, there's no particular answer as to how the other candidate emerges. Who has to raise it? And we say, so even if it was that, the same policy considerations that have led the common law to where it is would apply with equal, in fact, we say greater force in an internet defamation claim than they do in a personal injury claim or a contractual claim or, or anything else. 
that really brings us to the fourth and what is probably the most knotty of the major factors, which is what is the type of jurisdiction? Is this personal jurisdiction or is this subject matter jurisdiction? There is at least a, a, a dispute in the authorities about this, uh, and we deal with it in our skeleton argument at 72 uh, to 92. Um, I, I've said it, it doesn't actually make a difference for, for our argument. The first round of appeal is around evidential burdens, and I say it's the same answer whether it's subject matter or, or personal. But it is necessary for my learned friend. I, I was going to describe it as a linchpin. I think his word was a fulcrum. He needs to show that Section 9 is uh, subject matter jurisdiction, not personal jurisdiction, in order to release himself from the cases on burden and standard of proof that, that would otherwise bind. Uh, and at least in this case, he has um, uh, al Sadiq and Sadiq. You already have my submissions on that. You say Mr. Justice uh, Julian Knowles was wrong, uh, uh, and apparently omitted the, the um, paragraph 67 of the explanatory notes. Um, uh, and we say uh, he, he was therefore wrong to distinguish Hobnot and say, even if it's not uh, raised in time after the acknowledgement of service uh, by CPR 11 challenge, it doesn't matter because it can't be waived. Um, uh, and I've given your ladyships and your lordship the, the reference to Mr. Justice Nicklin at the first instance of writing there that volume two of the authorities, tab 13, page 409. That, that the passage in question runs from paragraphs 56 to 63, but, but it's really paragraph 58, uh, is, is the alternative case that, that this is about personal jurisdiction of CPR 11. Um, we, we do say, um, the High Court is, I think uniquely in this jurisdiction, is a court of general jurisdiction. Um, this court, um, the Supreme Court, the Crown Court, the County Court, the Family Court, all of them have uh, their jurisdiction granted to them by, by statute that is delimited in some way. Not the High Court, it has this general inherent jurisdiction, unless things are carved out of that. Um, so it can't hear election petitions. Um, it can't hit judicial reviews of the Crown Court acting uh, in the Crown Court's uh, capacity trying an indictment. But those ousters of the High Court's general jurisdiction, um, uh, uh, as a matter of rule of law, um, are skeleton argument at uh, uh, paragraph 82, so it's the, the recent proofs of the international case. Statutory provisions that purport to oust the subject matter jurisdiction of the High Court, as a matter of law, need to be very strictly construed. They need to be in very clear terms to be effective line of cases running back to Anna's minute. Um, we say if there is no particularly good policy reason why Parliament would have interposed sections 9 and 10 as subject matter jurisdiction ousters, they work equally well to deprive the court of personal jurisdiction, but they leave it up to the parties to bring to the court's attention relevant facts about their domicile and appropriate other fora or under section 10 about their role in publication. Very unusual to define subject matter jurisdiction by the characteristics of the defendant in a particular case, but that's what both sections nine and 10 do. That alone should be a good indication that we're dealing with personal jurisdiction, just as a matter of construction. And then just as a matter of sheer policy reasons, if my learned friend is right, then both sections 9 and 10 can be raised at any point, up to and including trial, possibly even on appeal, subject matter jurisdiction. Because it would mean that the court did not have the jurisdiction to do what it did, including enter judgment. Uh, and that might be, uh, depending on your perspective, it might even be attractive on the libel tourism, section 9. Front. One could imagine if section 9 had stood alone, maybe that would be plausible. In section 10, it would be particularly puzzling. Because section 10, which we haven't looked at in any great detail, makes clear in section 10.2 that its terms, author, editor, and publisher, have the same meaning as the existing statutory defense under section 1 of the 96 Act. Now, it's already a point of sort of archaic fascination that there might still be a sort of common law innocent dissemination defense running alongside the statutory defense in section 1 of the 96 Act. This apparently would allow yet another provision on top of those two defences to be run all the way to trial. And yet even though it refers to them and, and cross refers and borrows the same terms as section one, it doesn't seek to replace section one. It merely seeks to supplement it perhaps at trial. And we say 
that obviously isn't what Parliament was seeking to do. It makes far more sense on our analysis, and this is in our skeleton argument, the final section 10, to say section 10 is giving defendants who are not the author, editor, and publisher a quick personal jurisdiction CPR 11 way out of the case before they have to get to the point of filing and serving a defence, which can be very expensive, but also constitutes sufficient to the jurisdiction, but also loses them the opportunity to make offer of amends. It means that Section 10 allows people who are uh, not uh, the author, editor, or publisher to have a chance of getting out of the case quickly in the same way that a foreign defendant who is not within the personal jurisdiction of the court can get out early under CPR 11. If that Section 10 challenge fails, and it could fail for any number of reasons, it could be because the court finds there's a good arguable case they were the author, editor, or publisher, or it could find that they aren't, but it's not reasonably practical to sue the people who are. That sort of fuzzy basis. Uh, and, and on that basis, the court says, well, we do have jurisdiction because there's no one else that they can practically go against. And on that basis, we have jurisdiction under Section 10. At that point, the person has to file and serve a defence, but they can then run to trial, but they can still run the Section 1 defence in the 96 Act. And that's why we say it's quite clear that looking at the common cross-heading of Sections 9 and 10, which refer to jurisdiction, these are supposed to be preliminary jurisdictional objections, not things that are run all the way to trial. Uh, because in the case of Section 10, at least, there's no reason to run it all the way to trial, because if you could satisfy Section 10 by the time you get all the way to trial, you'd have a Section 1 defence. And the only support for the idea that Section 10 can actually be run all the way to trial was uh, uh, it's a throwaway comment by Mr. Justice Nicklin in Manier and Wood, where there was a, a challenge essentially on author, editor, and publisher. Uh, and although Section 10 had never been pleaded, I think it was sort of thrown into the ether at the trial, uh, but ultimately didn't have to be um, resolved. I think there might be a similar comment at the end of right and there, the passage to which I've just referred. So we say construing them together makes it yet clearer that what they're talking about is early stage personal jurisdiction challenges under CPR Part 11. It's not a whole new code free of all the authorities of the past. So, meshing together the four major issues and the three stages I talked about is the provision engaged, is there an alternative forum available, and which forum is appropriate. We say, the question, the 9 and 10 concern personal jurisdiction or subject matter jurisdiction? The answer is personal jurisdiction. Which party bears the legal burden of proof as to whether or not section 9 or 10 is engaged? We say, although it's not in dispute here, the legal burdens on the claimant, evidential burden on the defendant. And what's the standard of proof as to whether section 9 or 10 is engaged? And we say it's the good arguable case because it's the jurisdiction provision on an interlocutory basis, unless it's default judgment so that's engagement of the section. If section 9 is engaged because the defendant is domiciled outside the UK, which party has to identify the other candidate or candidates uh, uh, and show it's available? We say the evidential burden is on defendants to identify and prove it's available. We say expert evidence is necessary uh, for that uh, if no judicial notice can be taken. The standard of proof, again, to do that is the availability will be the good argument. And then if another forum is available so the comparison can be conducted, which party bears the burden of proof as to the comparative appropriateness of the forum, everybody agrees that legal burden falls on the claimant. Um, and the standard uh, to which it should be done is uh, the good arguable case. Again, unless it's default judgment, in which case it's balanced by the court. My ladies, my lord, that um, essentially ends my submissions on first ground and both the grounds of the response. Um, the only thing I have left now is I'd like to take relatively quickly, uh, if I may, is uh, the second ground, which is essentially the perversity challenge, unless your ladyship has a question. No, no, no. Oh, no. So sorry. No, thank you. Oh, great. Um, it's, well, <laughs> it's always dangerous to say anything's trite, um, but it, I think it's almost trite that um, uh, a, a discretionary decision or a, a multifactorial evaluation by a first instance judge uh, will be a decision in which an appellate court uh, should not interfere uh, unless there's some uh, error of principle.
uh, or a, a factual decision which is perverse, I one that no reasonable judge could have come to on the evidence before uh, her or him. Um, on the off chance that that's not considered trite and authority is needed, we, we have quite a few instances fighting on this court in, in this bundle. Uh, it, it's mentioned in the Spiliada in tab one, uh, in the head note at page 461, 8E. Uh, it was agreed by the Court of Appeal in King and Lewis, which is at tab three, head note, page 10. Uh, the Supreme Court in VCB and Nutritec, which is at tab seven, page 338C to F. Uh, but the one I was um, uh, hoping to uh, take your ladyships and your lordship to is uh, Berezovsky, uh, uh, which can be found at tab two uh, of the First Authorities Bundle. Um, this is Lord Hoffman, uh, it, it's not a uh, ratio I, I wouldn't seem to defend, although other members of the court made um, similar noises. But it's page 1023 uh, of Lord Hoffman's uh, judgment, uh, which is page 123, uh, I'm sorry, 122, my lord, of the Electronic Authorities Bundle. Uh, and if I could ask the court just to read from uh, A to E on that page, uh, beginning from So When Popperwell J. My lord, we, we say there's a, a great danger in taking a, a, a passage, let alone a single line of a, a judge's judgment uh, <laughs> out of context and focusing on that and saying that, that there is, is the error. But we say that's exactly what Grand Chief does. Uh, it says, once the judge had held, interposing there, the judge found, he didn't hold, but found that, in his view, C had been, and this is the quoted part, been far from forthcoming about his business interests both here and overseas, end quote. There was no safe basis for him to conclude that England and Wales was clearly the most appropriate place in which to bring the libel action, and he was wrong um, to so conclude. Um, for your ladyships and your lordships, know that's a paragraph 138 of the judgment. Um, you'll see from our, our posterior written submissions, um, which, which are a supplementary bundle, tab 10, although I don't ask your ladyships and your lordships to turn it up. Paragraph 29, we we sort of gave a, a recitation of the of the factors as how we saw them being weighed. Uh, and our case was this. In respect of the place of publication, um, looking at the uh, statistics uh, which were put in by um, my solicitor, and just the bundle reference, it's in my solicitor's uh, second witness statement, supplementary bundle, tab six, pages D115 and D116. Now this gave, it took the defendant's figures, but it broke them down by jurisdiction. So England, Wales, California, New York, Pennsylvania, the top four, for each of the eight publications. Now publication one is not sued upon in libel. We're out of time on that. So it's only two to eight. And none of those, about half of them, England, Wales, would come top, and about half of them, California, would come top. This was not a case like the explanatory notes, where there was 100,000 publications in Australia and only 5,000 here. England, Wales was in first place, depending on which measure you use, for about half of the publications we're suing on, and marginal second to California for the other half. Um, the first three defendants were domiciled in, in California. We say no other state of Commonwealth in the US was, was viable just on place of publication. Then you consider the, the legal factors, so the place of the tort, English law is the governing, is the governing law of the tort, the, the key factor that Lady Arden identifies in Livingston at paragraph 12. It's the centre of gravity of the dispute. If the defences were on truth, then this would be a, a key place for the availability of witnesses. The remedies available under sections 12 and 13 of the Act, specialist uh, trial of judge alone. We say there were plenty of legal factors that, that favoured England. 
But the most important thing, I began my submissions with paragraph one of the um, particulars of the claim. This is a personal claim by a man who has lived here since 2003, took citizenship 12 years ago. His family are all here, his children and his grandchildren, domiciled here, including for tax. And he made very clear, not only did he have dual citizenship, including British citizenship, but all seven of his companies uh, were um, in London. Now, the initial evidence, which we've been criticised for, which was done on an ex parte basis, is uh, at tab four of the supplementary bundles, volume one of the supplementary bundles. And having identified that he had several English companies, he also identified uh, factors at paragraphs uh, 33 to 36 that made England and Wales the proper place given that obviously he didn't have details of the place of publication. He disclosed all the litigation he had brought abroad including the Israel case where Israel said it was not from the Um and he disclosed that he had a, a, a passive property portfolio uh, in the United States but said uh, it's run and managed by a US partner. Mr. Sorion has never visited personally any of these properties and he's not involved in the management of this business. They already knew he had US properties because that was actually the subject matter of some of the publications, there were properties in, in Florida. He also declared that he had properties in Israel. So he did the things that he should do. The business links that were introduced by Mr. Doris, you've already been taken to by my learned friend, but they're on uh, page uh, 107 uh, uh, and 108 of the same bundle. This is Mr. Doris. Now, the companies at F at the bottom of page 107, my own friend already took you to our responsive evidence saying the claimant doesn't own them, doesn't control them. They're not relevant. It's our pleading of the fact that he's a family friend of Brothers and Netanyahu that's relied upon above that. The Senate Intelligence Committee report is of relatively little relevance in circumstances where it was recorded in the judgment that my client was a ghost online before he was invited to that committee. And in 700 pages, there's, I think, three sentences about it. It doesn't establish that he has links to or an established reputation in the United States. And so what the uh, evidence on business links uh, really came in from was that companies of which the claimant is a director have clients overseas. And it appears that the criticism of the is largely that he didn't give these defendants who have invaded his privacy and written grossly defamatory things about him, uh, didn't give them a list of not even his clients, his company's clients. We don't say that's any, I mean, Mr. Justice Jay is entitled to make the comment that he did. But it would be a startling thing if, for instance, uh, a lawyer who was domiciled in this uh, jurisdiction wanted to sue a defendant abroad, if the court would find it natural or even permissible that in order for him to establish that as well as this being the centre of his interest, his family, all of his companies being here, that that lawyer would have to disclose not his personal clients, but his company's clients, in order that it could be assessed how many people he knew overseas. In terms of the claimant's reputation overseas, it was somewhat nugatory because he just didn't have a public profile. And that was also a finding of the judge. So we say it just simply doesn't work for my own friend to say, there was insufficient disclosure of things that we wanted to know about your companies. But the judge was entitled to make the criticism even if we uh, don't accept it. We, we did rebut the key point. If it had turned out that we did actually have property interests, we hadn't disclosed them, but the evidence we put in in response was denial. We, he doesn't own control. That's the end of it. In those circumstances, it, it simply doesn't follow that because the judge criticised us on one area where he felt we hadn't been as forthcoming as he would have liked. How big would that be in the pantheon of factors that need to be considered in the foreign convenience assessment? It was not really in doubt that the claimant's centre of interest was here, or that many of the legal factors favoured this, or that many of the witnesses of truth would, would be here, or the governing law, or the forum, or the remedies. Against that, the fact that there was a slight reservation on one aspect of the evidence, whether or not you think that that reservation was fair or not, doesn't come anywhere close to the sort of perversity challenge that needs to happen if my own friends to overturn Mr. Justice, Justice Jay's judgment on that basis. It's paragraph 76, I'm sorry, of the judgment.
that, that refers to the party's uh, agreement he was largely unknown uh, and described as a ghost online. Uh, and that ghost reference comes back. So the paragraph after, just as Jay uh, says, that he was actually, let's, it, it would be helpful here, I think, if we actually turn up the judgment, given that it's, it is a perversity challenge uh, to find it a fact. Um, it's in the core bundle uh, of tab six. I think it might be helpful if we could start, it's core bundle tab six, if we could start at uh, paragraph 127, which is on page A121. This is the quote by Lady Arden, uh, given the judgment of the board in Livingston. This is a BVI case that was both service out and set aside. But after expert evidence, the judge for instance had decided that uh, uh, the Russian courts were not available as a forum. Uh, it, it is in the bundles, but there's no need for us to turn it up. Uh, but then at paragraph 12, um, her ladyship said, we're assessing whether there is another more appropriate forum. The court will consider what connecting factors exist in relation to that forum, such as the place where the alleged wrongs were committed and the governing law of the pleaded claims. The governing law is an important factor because it's generally preferable that a case should be tried in a country whose law applies. If there's no other available forum, which is clearly more appropriate, the court will ordinarily refuse to stay. I believe that ellipsis actually is a reference, if memory serves, to Lord Mavis in BTP and Nutritech. Um, paragraph 28 was um, the, uh, we had alluded to the jurisprudence on centre of interest, uh, and, and there's a reference there to Berezhovsky, and obviously the, the natural forum argument. Um, 29 are juridical advantages which under King and Lewis couldn't have been taken into account until stage two, but the stages were overruled in BTB. But paragraph 130, and this is actually quite important, paragraph 130 is the defendant's submissions on the idea that um, my client is a, is, a, is a global citizen, he has a global reputation like Hollywood actors or, or oligarchs or Boris Berezovsky or, or the like. Uh, and this is the reliance on the 24th of November letter um, that my little friend took um, parenthetically, there is um, a, a case it's cited in my skeleton argument at paragraph 45. Uh, it, it's the Court of Appeals' most recent exegesis on what good arguable case means. It's a case called CAFA. Um, uh, uh, we've included it. It wasn't necessary because there's not actually a dispute about that in this case. But CAFA, uh, the, the citation is 2019, first volume of the Weekly Law Reports, 3514. There is a, a, a comment, uh, Lord Justice Davis uh, gives a very short concurring judgment at the very end, um, it, it, in which he says it's, it clearly now means the better of the argument, not much the better of the argument, but much has been consigned to the darkness. Um, but he also makes a comment at paragraph 124 about um, evidential fishing exercises. Uh, and we're all aware of cases, including those um, that go all the way to trial, either in Delamere or the Preston Petrodel. Um, principle that uh, an attempt is made to say, give us X, and when X is not forthcoming, to turn to the court and say, draw the adverse inference that is most unfavourable. And that's somewhat deprecated by Lord Justice Davis. Um, the parties don't have disclosure obligations at this stage. Obviously, if a particularly pertinent question is asked and no answer is given, the court may, under certain circumstances, draw appropriate adverse inferences. Nobody doubts that. But the idea that a party can bootstrap their case by essentially asking all the questions that it, it would like to ask, um, and, and then sort of saying, ta-da, they didn't answer the questions that we wanted to ask, uh, as therefore um, getting them over the line is, is to be deprecated, according to uh, Lord Justice Davis in that court. Um, but this was the first attempt in paragraph 130 to, to talk about um, my client having a, a global reputation. Um, and. Uh, there were then submissions on the balance of convenience at 132. Uh, a consideration of the evidence that you uh, heard from Mr. Doris about uh, the claimant's um, uh, other uh, investments and business interests. At paragraph 136, uh, Mr. Justice J. Ever, ever eagle eyed, uh, noted from publication five that the defense are aware that he's owned properties in the UK for almost 30 years. Um, uh, and 137 again. We see the submission that the inference should be drawn that the claims reputation is a global one.
Just touching back earlier, paragraph 76 is the reference to a ghost, but I should just read that out for the court's uh, note. The parties appear to be in agreement that before the 5th of June, uh, the date of the point, the claimant was largely an, uh, was a largely unknown figure. According to Ms. Bertrand, he was virtually a ghost online. Uh, Ms. Callis points out he had only once before been quoted in Anglophone media as a spokesman for Diego Maradona. Um, so it was an ambitious submission to say that his reputation was a global one, um, but obviously an attempt to try and link him to people like Mr. Ahuja or Dr. Wright or um, Boris Berezovsky, who, who did have global reputations. They were known around the world for their activities. 138 is where we get um, the far from forthcoming that um, sets up ground two. Um, There is a slightly confusing comment at the end of 138 where the judge says in particular it would be useful to know if USG Security is his sole business barring investments in property uh, and the number and percentage of its clients, it's obviously not a phone book, the number of its clients who are based here. I would just point out that the particular claim did identify he has seven English companies. Uh, all of his companies are English and seven of them are in particulars. Um, but obviously he didn't uh, reveal their clients, which one can understand. There's a reference in 139 back to ghostly. But the upshot is a factual finding and or evaluation in 140 to 142. Notwithstanding the forensic mileage that accrues to the defendant's advantage from this state of affairs, I do not think Mr. Price did enough to contradict the claimant's evidence given through his solicitor that his personal and business life is centered in this jurisdiction, even if a significant if not number, if not proportion of his clients are based overseas. In my judgment, the instant case is somewhat sui generis. I do not think that the claimant's reputation may fairly be described as global. And then by comparison with Berezovsky in the next paragraph, Berezovsky and Wright. And he concludes paragraph 142. In my judgment, another reason for concluding that the claimant's reputation is centred here is that the available doesn't, evidence does not demonstrate it's centred anywhere else. Uh, and indeed, nor, nor could it. And so the conclusions of the judgment, you know, all of that evidence was properly taken into by the judge. He gave it as much mileage as it was worth. It was weighed with the other factors in exactly the way the parties had agreed it should be, um, uh, both on common law forum convenience and on section 9. And he came to an evidential decision. Very difficult, we say, to take that one fra fragment of a sentence in 138 and say, because of that one fragment of a sentence, a decision in my client's favour was perverse. Just not a, an appealable, it's, to begin with, it's not wrong. Even if it's not wrong, it would have to be perverse for this court to interfere. Um, so there are plenty of things that my client might not uh, agree with in, 
preparation for the filing of such a need to provide um, this information. Now, quite a lot of information is asked for. It's to be recalled that at this stage, of course, there was a, an array of claims being aimed at the defendants. Um, this, these requisitions don't go solely to the, to the um, Section 9 matters. Um, some of them, towards the end, um, go to allegations and assertions made by the claimant more generally. And some of them go to his case that they were acting in concert with other people. Um, their assertions that were ultimately rejected. But in terms of the Section 9 matters, um, the questions are designed, as I think is apparent from reading them, to get an overview of the claimant's international uh, profile and business dealings. And had they been answered uh, in such a way as to direct uh, the defendants to the conclusion that it, it can only be the case that he has a reputation worth defending in this jurisdiction, or um, that there might be an emerging candidate in the US, either the US generally or in the States. Of course, it's criticism that they then failed to produce evidence. Um, a position would have more teeth. But when these requests were met by Simon, um, that criticism falls, uh, falls short of its target. So I come to the point of um, my lady, Lady Justice Lang, which is uh, about. What happens if we sort of fall through the cracks in relation to external evidence? None is before the court, but the court has to um, consider matters that might involve matters of foreign law. Well, again, the problem for the court in those circumstances it, it is that it's not been given sufficient information to identify an alternative jurisdiction. It would be artificial for the court then to fall back on a presumption that foreign law internationally, in any jurisdiction it might choose for other reasons, is the same as English law. Maybe it should have done so. Um, but but that, in my submission, that, that would be far-fetched. But the point is we don't get to that position because the claim is not equipped to be there. There is significant uncertainty um, about where his reputation sits. Now, he may claim to be a ghost online, but that doesn't mean he is a literal ghost. Of course, he has business dealings. He's proven to have business dealings around the world. Those people must know who he is. People that deal with him in his particular seven companies. Um, wh where are they? So, There's a point raised by uh, my Lord Justice Warby about the most appropriate place, which set some alarm bells ringing because it opened up a can of worms. Um, but, but I have a, I have a, a, a um, submission to make on this. The most appropriate place bring an action, must be the place that is most appropriate, having regard to the degree of potential vindication to the claimant. Um, and of course that brings us back to the point I've just been making, that that place, the place where it is most appropriate to have a trial to achieve that matter. That must be related to um, an assessment of the various places.
it's um, if, if it turns out that whilst the defendant uh, claimant has a reputation in England, um, the really uh, the, the, the vindication he's really seeking, uh, or, 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 or the greatest degree of vindication that he could seek, was in another place. It couldn't be appropriate to bring the action in England because, of course, the, uh, the result of an English action um, couldn't vindicate him in that other place, but for the reasons given by um, my lord. So, we keep getting dragged back to this problem of um, the degree to which a claimant needs to be frank uh, and put their cards on the table. Case law on section 9 has consistently emphasised that need. And we say that the claimant in this case didn't do that. Uh, 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 and the judge, Mr Justice Jay, was, was left scrabbling around in, in the, the articles themselves looking for evidence in relation to the claimant's re reputation. Eagle-eyed as he is, he was able to find a little bit of additional evidence in the fifth article. Um, it wasn't evidence put before him by the claimant. Now, if if it's right that the claimant has a heavy burden in these sorts of cases, that that was certainly no hardship to him here. He knew the defendants. Domiciled. He knew their addresses and was able to give them in his evidence. Those jurisdictions should have been top of the list of potential available jurisdictions. And he should have addressed them if his case was that they were less appropriate uh, in places to sue those defendants who lived there uh, that than in England. We've discussed it, um, the potentially flexible approach whereby the degree, um, the, the quality of uh, evidence adduced by a defendant might be um, measured against their means or their ability to produce expert evidence. And um, for certain defendants, one might accept something drawn off the internet about how, about how defamation as a cause of action exists in a particular jurisdiction. I think that was a nut the nut shell uh, guide that was given as an example. Well, um, that may be right, but of course the equality of the evidence in the sixth defendant's case um, was sort of somewhere between that and a fully fledged um, Part 35 compliance report. It was um, contained in a, a witness statement the letter from US Wells exhibited to it is at B763. The evidence established that there would be no bar to bringing an action in the Washington court, but that there may be a procedural bar related to the value of the claim, um, this is paragraph 79, by bringing 